Our Heavenly Father, we come together this morning as one body, coming in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful this morning for the name of Jesus that sounds so sweet in our ears. Father, we thank you this morning that the name of Jesus soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fear. Father, we want to pray uh, this morning for those who need to hear those words. Father, we pray for those in our church who are unwell at the moment. Father, we want to uh, pray this morning um, for Alwyn as she is in hospital. Father, we pray that even on this day she would have the name of Jesus in her ear. Father, we want to pray for Van this morning. Father, as she has uh, treatment at the moment, Father, we pray for her again, that she would know the soothing balm of your gospel. Father, we pray this morning for our sister Llyneth. Father, we thank you for her and pray for her, Father, as she has uh, different treatment. Father God, uh, would you draw near to her? Would she know you as the rock on which she stands? Father, we think of Peter Price this morning, uh, who is unwell and in hospital. Father, we pray for him, that he would know you as his shepherd, brother, and friend. Father, we think of those who have uh, moved away over the last months. Father, we think of uh, Mrs. Pooley and Margaret Davis, and we pray your hand of blessing upon them in their new places. Father, that they would know you, that, Father God, that they uh, would trust in you. And Father, for uh, those in our midst who are ill and we're unaware, Father, of those in our church who are struggling with thoughts, Father, struggling with mental health, Father, would you draw near to them too? We thank you that today there is a gospel that soothes and gives balm to our soul. So Father, be with us today as we open your word, be with the Sunday school and with the Narnians, we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, again, um, a warm welcome uh, to church uh, this morning. Um, Anthea isn't with us uh, this morning, um, which is always the highlight of our service, and I didn't feel prepared to get any puppets out. Um, but Belinda and Andy are happy to lead us in a song. Um, so, children, this morning we're going to do a song which has actions, um, which is Jesus' love is very wonderful. So, Belinda showed me the actions because I'm very slow. So, children, if you want to have a go with this, so it's Jesus love is very wonderful should we try that jesus love is very wonderful and then the chorus goes so high you can't get over it so low is it low or wide first so low you can't get under it so wide you can't get around it oh wonderful love so children if you want to stand up and try these um, actions you can but belinda and andy will lead us and i'll try and do the actions as well let's try this
Great, thank you so much, uh, Blinda and, and Andy. Um, well, today we're in our series, The New Normal. Each week we're looking at uh, different things that perhaps some of us may need to reintroduce uh, into our life. Some weeks, I'm sure there are sermons you listen to and you think, no, no, I, I do this already, John, and that's, and that's wonderful. We're all in, in different places. But today, I want to look at the conscience. I want to look at confession and conviction. Things that perhaps in our life, in the old normal, pre-pandemic, some of us may not have had time for. Um, over the last few weeks, I saw some artwork projected um, onto the side of uh, one of the main buildings in Cardiff, which was the artwork of a band, Pink Floyd. Um, and as a teenager, I used to love uh, Pink Floyd. And one of my favourite songs was a song called Comfortably Numb. Comfortably Numb. And I always felt that that word, that phrase, summed up That's our hearts in many senses. In here now, turn that up. Our society. That really, we build our lives in a way sometimes that is sure. comfortably numb. Uh, how, how do we do that? Some of you can remember the book Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, so media is one way sometimes that we fill our minds in such a way that we... We just stay comfortable, but it's comfortably numb. We're numbing ourselves. So today that could be TV or Netflix, but it could be books and novels. I remember um, a young student, I was uh, discipling and teaching how to preach, and he came up with one of the best um, talks I'd ever seen. He was an artist, and his talk was a very interactive talk. And what he'd done was he'd taken old letters, and on the back of the letters had drawn covers of Mills and Boons, Mills and Boons. And really, he was talking about someone who lives their life just daydreaming of another life. Their doodle just brings something where they're not quite happy with what they've got, and they just doodle away. But I think as well, we can be comfortably numb through many different things. Exercise and Strava achievements, money things and stuff, social media and internet, alcohol, and even doing good. Sometimes we rally behind a cause to make the world a better place so that we don't have to deal with what's going on in our hearts. And I think for some of us, um, there have been seasons and maybe the pre-pandemic or even this last year has been a season when we're hardly ever alone with our thoughts. We seldom deal with deep regrets, hurts and shame. There are things which we just file away and we fill our lives with other things in the hope of keeping them suppressed, a kind of comfortable numbness. I think when you look at the history of society and the world, um, particularly the last 25, 30 years, we've probably filled our life where the gaps where we used to think are no longer there. Um, those moments of boredom, those moments of being left with your own thoughts, not with someone else's thoughts. Um, if you have a smartphone like me, it will have 101 notifications constantly disturbing your own train of thought. Don't think what you think. This is what I want you to think. Be that people wanting attention through emails or advertising or social media. Now, why is this the case? Why have we perhaps lost this space to think? Well, I think some of it is imposed upon us. So in society, people really want us to spend money to be comfortably numb. It's a big business to appease people's conscience. That's why we use phrases like retail therapy. Why deal with your issues when you can go to spend money to feel better, or wine wallowing, or box set binging? But I think as well, there can be a deeper reason, not just society, um, but please don't think I'm overly using this word, uh, but Satan. I, I think the devil doesn't want us to spend time searching our hearts, doesn't want us to be a person of conscience who's convicted and confesses sin, because ultimately, as we're going to see today, whenever you do that, you end up finding yourself comforted in Christ. And actually, Satan doesn't want us to do that. But we're not simply victims. Actually, I think some of these things are indulged by us. If I'm honest, I'm scared of my conscience. I'm scared to be left alone with my thoughts. I don't know if you understand that. 
sometimes we can be scared to be left alone with our thoughts because of the fear of crushing condemnation. There's things in our life, things that we have done or have happened to us, and we don't want to think about it because we're scared that we're worse than we think we are. And more than that, we're scared that God will find out that we're worse than we think we are. And sometimes we don't want to have time for conscience because of the fear of crushing condemnation. Or perhaps, particularly maybe in younger years, we don't want to be left with our thoughts because of this idea that God is a boring burden. That is, um, I've, when I worked with students, I, I saw this um, a lot. Um, they didn't want to deal with issues because they were worried if they listened to God, God would have more boring plans for their life than they did. So I remember um, a student saying to me um, that she wasn't praying for a husband because she was scared that if God realized she wanted a husband, God wouldn't let her have one and would send her to be a single missionary. It's a fascinating um, kind of uh, thing that comes in that actually God's desire in heaven is to get you to do the hard thing. And the hard thing is always the opposite of the happy thing. And so sometimes we don't spend time in our conscience because we're scared of either crushing condemnation or boring burden. But what if conscience was good? Or more importantly, what if God were good? What if spending time searching your heart and your conscience led you to a God who was good? And actually a God who didn't just offer a numb comfort, but true comfort, a comfort that wasn't numb. I've repeatedly quoted the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism here. And I love the Heidelberg Catechism question one because it's so pastoral. It says this, what's your only comfort in life and death? Answer, that I'm not my own but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful saviour, Jesus Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism begins with this understanding that God is good. And when you find yourself in him, there is comfort. As we sang in the first hymn, the name of Jesus is a sweet name. He soothes us. So what happens if it actually works like this? Conscience, conviction, confession, consolation, as we come to confession at the cross, and then a close invitation to communion that leads to comfort, true comfort. What if that was actually God's plan for our life? Could we be missing out on a key part of what it means to be human and a child of God? Now, I need to address two groups of people this morning. So I'm going to have two points, two groups of people. But what you're going to see is the answer is exactly the same for both. But I want to just show why conscience and conviction is slightly different in two different circumstances. But the answer is going to be um, exactly the same. So the first group of people I, I want to try and um, help this morning are not yet Christians. So, so if you're not a Christian yet... I want you to understand that conviction of sin is for conversion. It's for conversion. So I've got two key passages this morning. So for the first part, my key passage is Luke chapter 15, one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. But I want to read it to you, Luke chapter 15 and verses 11 to verse 32. This is the parable um, of the lost son. Let me read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, 
his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son, threw his arms round him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brothers come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered his property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is one of the great passages on conscience and conviction. You know the story so well. The son despises his father. He wants his stuff, not him. And in effect, he's saying, I wish you were dead. Because when do you get the inheritance? When someone dies. That's what he's saying. But really, there's something wrong in the heart of this son. He doesn't want his father, he wants his stuff. And then as soon as he gets a chance, he goes as far as, as far as he can go, goes to a city and spends it on wild living. Here is someone who can't settle. Here is someone who isn't satisfied. Here is someone searching for something. And he lives a fast life. And all of his money goes very fast. He has zero left. Now, Jesus is teaching to people, and in those people are Jews listening in. And Jesus puts in that little pinch. He finds himself eating amongst the pigs. This would have been a very unclean place, the kind of lowest of the lowest place to find himself. And when he's in that low place, he comes to his senses. It's an interesting way to describe conscience and conviction, isn't it? He comes to his senses. And it's fascinating. This is what he realizes about his dad. Did you notice? He doesn't just realize that his father will forgive him. He realizes that his father would be a better slave master than the world is a friend. I'd rather go home and just be a slave, a hired hand in my father's house, than have the friendship of the world. He comes and realizes that the very best thing is the thing that he has given up. And I think when you look through the parable of the lost son, the whole story really is one of him trying to fill his mind, trying to be comfortably numb, trying not to deal with this broken relationship with the father. You see, the reality is sometimes we do need to be shocked into our conscience because we tend to ignore it. I've been listening this week to the um, account of the life of a man named John Bunyan. John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, one of the greatest storybooks um, ever written. And John uh, Bunyan wrote an account of how he became a Christian. Um, he came from one of the roughest backgrounds. Um, he came from a place where he had no prospects uh, in life. He really was a wild, wild uh, guy. He was known for the way he swore, for example. Even, even prostitutes would stop him and say, can you stop swearing? He, he'd literally go to the roughest part, and even the roughest people would stop him and say, hey, calm down, calm down. He was someone who loved to just fill his life playing sports or having fun or um, doing things he, he shouldn't be doing. And throughout his life, he has moments when he starts to realize that this isn't right. And he has moments where he starts to hear the Bible being taught. But every time he hears it, he pushes it away. There's one time in the book where he describes going to church and he's listening to the preacher, and it's as if the preacher's talking to him. It's as if the preacher has gone up that morning, read his diary, and gone, ah, right, this is what John Bunyan is thinking. I'm going to pick on everything in his heart. And he sits there in the church, hears all of this, and has a moment of clarity. And then he says this, and I went out, 
and ate and went back to play and went back to play. His conscience was pricked, but as soon as he ate, it was gone. Do you know, perhaps um, you've been watching church online this year or uh, coming along to church and there's been moments of clarity, moments when you thought, wow, th this God is real. <laughs> Jesus died for me. Actually, there, there is something I need. And maybe you've had moments where deep down something has come to the surface and you've suppressed it to be comfortably numb. Do you know, the wonderful thing is, that's not God trying to guilt you. That's not really, in one sense, God even trying to condemn you. That is, condemn just for death. No, no, that's God trying to convict you. That is trying to show you that there is a need and he is the answer. That actually all of that stuff, that guilt and that shame, that desire to strive and prove yourself, that desire to be seen as good, actually that can all go away because Jesus has done it all. The amazing thing is about John Bunyan is it just comes to a moment where in the end he has to stop and think. Now, John Bunyan, just to be fair, if you go off and buy the book, he definitely did it in the extreme. <laughs> I mean, he went off for months on end. Um, I'm not sure I would encourage that. And, and most introductions to that book tell you this is an exceptional example. Don't quite follow what he did. But the principle is still the same. Sometimes we need to have moments like the prodigal son where we realize actually I'm not right with God. And you see, the wonderful thing is conviction never comes on its own. Conviction is never about just showing you the problem. That would be cruel. Why just show someone the problem? No, no, God shows us the problem so he can reveal to us the solution so that he can take that guilt, he can take that shame, he can take that desire to prove yourself away. I always love in the story of the parable of the prodigal son, and I know you've all heard 101 sermons on this, so you know everything in the parable. But my favorite part is where it says that when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. How did he see him? Because he was looking for him. He was waiting for him. And he, in those days, the men would have had big, long, flowing uh, dresses, basically. He runs after him, which means he would have had to lift it up. I'm not a woman, so I don't quite understand these things. But he would have lifted them up. He would have shown his varicose veins to the world. And he would have run to embrace the son who had said, I wish you were dead. The humiliation for the father to do that is everything. You see, with conviction... God never wants to humiliate you. He wants to show you your true state so that you can trust in him because he humiliated himself for us. Interestingly, when you look at Luke 15, I don't think it's talking about God the Father. I think the Father in Luke 15 is Jesus. Jesus is the one who came down and ran towards us. The Father sent the Son. Jesus is the one who humiliated himself by going to the cross for us perhaps you've been watching and, and listening in for the last year and you've had pangs and moments those are prods from the holy spirit from god saying come to me and he wants to run to you and do you notice what he does he doesn't let him get to the end of his speech have you ever noticed that the son has a much longer speech the father stops him before the son gets to the end of his speech the father is shouting out get the fattened calf we're gonna have a party See, the reason why as a Christian I need not fear my conscience is because whatever I find in my conscience, Jesus runs towards me. And when he runs towards me and forgives me, because he died the ultimate shame on the cross, everything is gone. Everything is paid for. He wants to show me it so he can cover it, so that it can be taken away as far as the east is from the West. So perhaps today or this week, if you're not yet a Christian, perhaps in that moment of conscience, you can pray a, a simple prayer. This is a prayer that millions have prayed. Maybe some people in this church have prayed. And it's a prayer that says this, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. 
I turn from my sins and invite you to come in to my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour. There's a wonderful invitation. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, Jesus welcomes you. But what about Christians this morning? If you're a Christian, Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Does that mean you don't need to have a conscience? You don't need to have conviction? You don't need to have confession? Well, no. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ because Jesus has paid the price. You can't be condemned for anything. So there's no need for the Christian to spend time in your conscience, to be convicted of sin, to confess your sin in order to be saved. There's no need for conviction, for conversion for the Christian. But there is need, I believe, for conviction and confession for communion. So our conversion, our saved status as a Christian never changes, never changes because it's based on what Jesus has done. You can't lose your salvation, but our experience of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our communion is variable. It is variable. There are times in our Christian life when we feel as though God is distant. There are times in our life as Christians when we feel we can't pray. And really, that is the variation of your communion. Now, please, please notice, you can't lose your salvation. But you can lose the enjoyment of your communion. You can, as Paul puts it in Ephesians, grieve the Holy Spirit. It is possible to do that. And so, secondly, and very quickly, Christians, we need conviction for communion. So even though we're forgiven, that's a fact, that's forever, we still need to daily, I believe, come before God and in our conscience confess our sins. Where do I get that from? Well, our second key passage this morning, if you already haven't guessed, is Matthew chapter 6 and verses 9 to 15. Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 15, probably again the most well-known passage in the Bible, um, known by school children up and down the country, the Lord's Prayer. This is how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, and this is how we today pray as Christians. Our Father in heaven, so we're praying to our Father in heaven, so these are converted Christians. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus taught us to pray taught us to pray daily and said daily we should pray for the forgiveness of sins. That cannot be the forgiveness of sins that leads to salvation. You don't need to pray every day that God would save you. You don't wake up every morning no longer a Christian. So if all of our sins are forgiven in Christ, what is Jesus teaching us to do? Well, he's teaching us to pray for the forgiveness of sins. But not of a God who we don't know, but of our Father who loves us and will never leave us go. We can sin even against our Heavenly Father, even as Christians. And whilst we need to pray for that forgiveness, those sins don't lead to a losing of our salvation. What they do is affect our relationship with the Father, our enjoyment of our relationship with Him. Sins in our lives bring clouds between us and the sun, the sun and the light and the ray of God's goodness. There are actions in our life that can grieve the Holy Spirit. There are sins which can sear our conscience. And so Jesus wants us to confess them. What are the kind of things? What kind of things do we need to confess? Well, I think walk through the Lord's Prayer. It'll tell you everything you need to do. So I think the best way personally to read pray the Lord's Prayer is to pause between each line. I think it's unhelpful on a personal level anyway to say it wrote line by line back to back. It becomes a little bit too ritualistic. Rather it's something to pray and ponder. So our Father in heaven, 
Am I living as a child of God? Am I enjoying his presence? Or have I sought to satisfy myself with other gods, made other gods sweet? Hallowed be your name. Am I living for his name or my name? Am I representing his name well? Am I witnessing your kingdom come? Whose kingdom do I want? Who is the king of my life? Am I building for me or am I building for Jesus? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Am I following the Bible? Are my decisions based on his word or my wishes? Give us today our daily bread. Am I trusting God? Am I resting in him for resources? Is what he gives enough? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Am I forgiving others or am I holding a grudge? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Am I playing with sin? Am I joking around with temptation? Simply praying the Lord's Prayer slowly is really that moment of conscience where we can have conviction of sin and then confess the sin. But the conviction and the confession is only the start. It's only the start because we're confessing to God our Father. We're confessing to Jesus who ran towards us in humiliation to die for us. We're confessing in the light of the cross. We only spend time in our conscience for conviction and confession so that we can have the consolation and comfort of the confidence that Jesus died on the cross for us. And we can put that together. That's what we need to learn to do. Now, a few notes in this. There's so much we could say this morning, but time is, is brief. Note one, even if we confess our sins and there is forgiveness, we still have to deal with the fallout of sin, particularly relational sin. So the context is Matthew 5, where Jesus says, if you go to church and worship, and then remember that someone has something against you, interesting, you go and be reconciled. So we must confess, yes, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with the impact of sin. But another note is to say that confession breaks the power of sin. Some of us are struggling with repetitive, habitual sins, sins that seem to take us slave, and the reason is a lack of confession. That's, that's the reason. No Christian should be ruled by sin. We don't need to be. The reason we're ruled by sin is because we don't confess the sin. We hide the sin. We keep the sin in the dark and the sin festers. But if you bring the sin to God into the light, then actually the power of the sin is gone. You see, we sin and we hide it and we feel guilty about it. And then we think, well, I may as well sin again. And we don't go to God for strength because then we feel guilty. How can I ask God for strength for something that I've done and I haven't come to him about? Actually, confession breaks the power of sin. That's why 1 John 1 and 1 John 1, 2 are so brilliant. If we confess our sin, he's just, he's faithful, he'll forgive it to you. Look, if you say you haven't got sin, you're deceiving yourself. Just admit it. Come to him and he takes it away. And I would say just very briefly that public confession of sin can be incredibly powerful. I'm not asking you to come up the front this morning and confess your sin. But actually sometimes talking to a friend, that can be really powerful. We can, as, as James 5 says, we can confess our sins to each other. But as well as a church each week, if we pray for confession of sins, as we do that here, we learn that we can confess our sins. And we learn that there's a confidence in the gospel for the forgiveness of sins. So Christian, can I encourage you? Perhaps start praying the Lord's Prayer. Don't hide your conscience. Don't worry about finding things. There's no crushing condemnation. And God is not a boring person who's going to give you worse things. Actually, he wants you to be free of the guilt and the shame. The very thing that Jesus died for is the very thing we sometimes don't apply to our hearts. Come to Jesus, and he, by his Spirit, will forgive all. As Richard Foster puts it, confession begins in sorrow, but ends in joy. 
ends in joy. Go back to the parable of the prodigal son. He will run towards you and party. Always remember, no matter what you've done, the Lord Jesus will run towards you and celebrate your forgiveness. And so with thankfulness, in the full assurance of the forgiveness of sins, that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. We pray that we would leave this place in joy, celebrating the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we pray this all for your glory. Amen. <laughs>